my mother would nip my nose, and when I opened my mouth, in would go the castor oil. Now the castor oil, you enjoy laughing, but who has the last word in your life? God or you? Now the last word is the only operative word. Nothing else counts. It's the last word. If you or children have the last word with you, the last word is the only word. Give a child a reason, the child will give you seven back. You're not going out. Why? You give a child a reason, it's rain. Well, I won't pay, play in the pool. I'll go in the shed. I'll put my Wellingtons on. Give a child a reason, he give you seven back. You know why? Because that's how you deal with God. You're the child. God is your father. And if you are having the last word with God, you'll find it totally impossible for you to speak with authority to your children. Let God be true. The last word is the only word. Now, inside my being, the conflict goes on. My heart seeks to have the last word with God. Like was said, are not the banner and father. May I not wash in them. If the Lord made windows in heaven, how can this be, seeing I know not a man? Watch what goes on inside your own being. And you'll find this. You don't necessarily speak the last word. You can say it in your heart. But if you have the last word with God, you've made God a liar. Now, here comes a compulsory situation in revival. Because God temporarily puts that lying heart of mine out of function, puts it to sleep, and comes directly to my spirit. And what comes to my spirit is always truth. In almost 70 years, never once have I ever known the witness of the Spirit of God in my being to anything but truth. I can't bring it down. I can't work it up. But once I've got that witness, that's it. It's always the truth. In revival, God comes to put life right. There are signs and wonders. Then we get where we turn the signs and the wonders into a goal. But the signs and the wonders are not a goal. People go after them, but they're not a goal. They are a witness to a goal, and the goal is the truth. Everything that's in revival is to witness to truth. The truth is primary. The truth is the glory of God. And uh, I found this. I read a book. Some years ago, some of you have read it. Another wave comes rolling in by a man called Frank Bartleman, who was one of the early pioneers at Azusa Street. Azusa Street was where revival first came that birthed the Pentecostal movement in America. There had been preliminary showers under Mrs. Woodworth Etta, John G. Lake, and Dr. Dowie. They were at the end of the 19th century, and they had life, and they had vision, and they were kind of John the Baptist, heralding in the Pentecostal movement at the end of the 19th century. Then it tipped over. And then came Azusa Street, a one-eyed black man called Seymour in a tin shack with his head in boot boxes, was used of God to introduce the Pentecostal movement in America. In England, Cannon Body at All Saints Church in Sunderland 
1905, Fox flying from the Welsh Revival was used to God to introduce the Pentecostal movement in Britain. From there, it trickled into a flow, it flowed into a river, and the river went into a volume. And we have what's termed the Pentecostal movement. I was expelled in 1934 because I'd embraced the truth of Pentecost. This we term revival. There were signs and wonders which always attract people. Now, it's right for God to give signs. These signs shall follow them that believe. But whilst it's right for God to give signs, it's wrong for men to seek signs. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. The moment you turn signs and miracles and visions and all these things into an ultimate goal which men always go after, The one thing that they're after is the supernatural. The supernatural. In Ireland, they said there was a statue of the Virgin Mary that winked her eye. And thousands of Roman Catholics went to see the Virgin Mary wink her eye. They built an airport called Knock. And like Lewis, they went. But why did they went? Why did they go? Well, they go to get healed, or they go to have a spiritual experience. They want a demonstration. They want something out of the ordinary basic living. Now, that's understandable if you're blind or deaf or crippled. But the moment the witness turns into the truth, now you understand why John the Baptist had to have his head cut off. Because he was not the Savior, he was witness to the Savior, and so God moved him out. He could just as easily have opened the prison doors like he did for Peter, but he didn't. John had to lose his head because he wasn't the head. He must increase, I must decrease. John's gone. John did no miracle, but Jesus did many miracles. But the miracles were not the goal. They were to attest the truth, and that truth was embodied in a man called Jesus. Now then, you've only got to announce Forest Drive Church. A blind man received his sight. A sick person was instantly healed. You're in business. You're in business. They'll flock. They'll come. They don't come for God. They come for me. How do I know? That's how I came. My father had a need. But out of that came my salvation, my mother's salvation, my father's salvation, and so on. But the worm on the end of the hook was, the bait was something to draw people. Now then you know how always in the Pentecostal movement, the, uh, the psychological uh, something, people are laid on the floor. Somebody saw an angel, right, and always the crowds come. Is that revival? It may lead to revival. It may witness revival. But revival must go deeper than the physical. And God will have a people, and I believe this, that whether it's down there at the panhandle 
or whether it's up in Toronto, or whether it's Sunderland, whether it's Rodney Howard Brown, or anybody else you care to mention, that God is beginning to move and attract people's attention. With Moses, it was a bush that burned and wasn't consumed. Prior to 1926, Stephen Jeffrey, saved under Evan Roberts in Welsh Revival, came out to the mines, started a 30-day evangelistic campaign in the Island Hall, Flanetley, and South Wales, and above the pulpit there appeared a fluorescent lamb. 30 days and 30 nights the lamb shone. It turned into the face of Jesus. And when they put the lights out at night time, people would go peeping through the keyhole. And there was the lamb. And it attracted. Stephen Jeffries took that to the call of God like Moses took the burning bush. And he went out. Thousands were saved in his ministry. Hundreds were healed. I know. I went to Wakefield. I went to Doncaster. I went to the Boxing Hall, Newcastle, I was in Sunderland, I was in Bishop Auckland, and as a young Christian, in your immaturity, you do like the teenagers do with Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley or Marilyn Monroe or somewhere like that. You have your idol, you have your images. I was to say. And I saw men rather than God. But God was using men. But maybe I'll sit down a minute. Don't get discouraged. You say, he's got going now. He'll never stop. <laughs> but how do you define revival? Now, obviously, its judgment must begin at the house of God. One thing about revival, the church has got to get cleaned up. And miracles or whatever, laughing in the spirit and all the rest. Okay, I don't mind how high you jump, as long as when you come down, you walk straight. Zacchaeus, he said, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I robbed any man, I'd restore it. Is the revival if debts aren't paid? Is the revival if forgiveness isn't manifest amongst the people of God. Is the revival if lives are not in order? Is the revival while our families are split and torn and helpless children are victims of, of, of a tug of war between men and women who have divorced? I know that there are cases of divorce that can be righteous, but maybe 90% of all divorce is based on unforgiveness. You want your rights? If you got them, you'd be in hell. Forgive us our trespasses. How as we forgive? To me, this is revival. A straightening out of life. A repentance that brings forth fruit. You pay your debt. You pay your bills. You break before God. You ask for forgiveness. You love people. There's reconciliation. All these things. Now you may have people hopping and jumping round. You may have them laughing in the spirit. But if the ultimate is not to the vital issue where judgment must begin at the house of God, I wonder. I'll sit down and you can have a go at me. You can fall out with me or fall in with me, shoot me down in flames, or whatever you want. But to me, I believe something's coming so tremendous on this planet, so mind-boggling, that the church is going to be the recipient of judgment, not the homosexuals in... not and the Shiite out there, it may get to them, it will get to them, but it begins right
so that Glenn says, why does revival stop? We know how it starts. God stretches his hand out. Why does it stop? Test what I say. It's always the issue that man touches the glory. His sin won't stop it. God has dealt with sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Sin is a consequence. It's a third position. Sin always comes out of unbelief. Unbelief is expressed in pride, where a man chooses to be a God instead of having a God. And out of self-exaltation, he launches into unbelief, which comes down to earth in sin. The sin issue, the consequence, is dealt with, but the cause is not. You just cobweb it down, but until you catch the spider, you'll always have cobweb. The church will cease one day to deal with sin and begin to repent and break and humble itself, which is the cause. Test what I say. You may not agree with me. I love you just the same, whether you do or you don't. But test it. Don't believe it, because I say so. What's the witness of the Spirit? You are the jury. Answer the problem that we've got today. The church. For answer, however you look at it. We are supposed to be the people on the face of the earth. We're supposed to be riding high. God gave us a birthright. God gave us dominion. And look at the people of God. Look at the people of God who are dying of cancer. What's the answer to cancer? Look at the people of God whose lives are broken and ruined with divorce. Splitting up, how many is it? Two out of three. We can go to the moon. We can't live in the same kitchen with one another. What an indictment to people that God has said you'll be over. Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man and let him have dominion. And then he says, over, 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 over. You were born to be over. Now then, look at the situation. I'm under the clock. I can't stop. I'm in a hurry. Well, didn't God give you 24 hours to you a day? Are you trying to push 26 hours into a 24 day? You have two hours out of the will of God. Every day there's enough time to do the will of God. If you're under stress, you're out of the will of God. So that's a strong statement. I guess it. Well, I, I thought you would. And I do too. <laughs> but how many people? You don't have nervous breakdowns in the Holy Ghost. You have them out of the Holy Ghost. Not in the whole Stress. Stress. I'm under the clock. I'm under the dollar. I can't afford a bargain. <laughs> Fell off a lorry. The lust, the greed, the covetousness. God wrapped my fingers. He said to me, if it's my will, you can afford it. If it's not my will, you shouldn't want to afford it. Guidance by circumstance. I was never meant to be scraping and scratching. We've gone to another extreme. The big time preachers, uh, prosperity, Cadillacs and swimming pools and helicopters and all the rest. As if that defined prosperity when there were those who wandered in caves and dens of the earth, who were cut in half, there were stones. 
I don't know how that fits or whether it ever would. Under over. Sin shall not have dominion over you. And it does. Why? Because two thirds will never do what three thirds were meant to do. And we're only in a two thirds revelation. We've had Passover, we've had Pentecost, and we're on the thresholds of tabernacles. And until tabernacles come, you will never effectively do what's meant to be done in three thirds, and two thirds will never do it. Like we said at the church this morning, if you're in first gear, or you're in second gear, your gear governs, not the potential of your engine. You may have an engine that will do 120, but you're in second gear, so you're crawling. And unless you declutch, and to declutch you've got to leave to go. And if you won't leave, you can't go. And so, here we are crawling in a two-third revelation in second gear, or maybe third gear. And out of our third gear, judging everybody in second gear, not knowing that there's a fourth gear and an overdrive that only comes through tabernacle. Would you accept that? That the tragedy of the church today, they think they've got it all. And we've been, many of us have been taught to believe that. You've arrived. You say, oh yes. You spoke in tongues. Oh yes. Kuluma Kalama Kuluma Yes. You've been baptized more. Yeah. Right. You're ready for heaven. But the policeman who found a dead horse in McConaughey Street, Street in McConaughey Street in Dublin, he didn't know how to spell McConaughey on his report sheet, so he pulled the dead horse into King Street. <laughs> Is that not the tragedy of our lives? Pulling our dead horses rather than having the truth. Look, I know what I should be, and I know what God wants, but this is where I am, and I cannot move from where I am till I admit where I am. You'll never move from where you are till you have the truth. Now, to me, having the truth is revival. Truth in the inward part is revival. Signs and wonders may witness to it. Miracles may witness to it, but basically, God will have a people where judgment begins at the house of God, and that requires truth in the inward part, which means all that you ever did in your two-thirds revelation to relate to man's need and your comfort and your lust and your desire is all food for the bonfire. It's garbage, and every man's work to be tried in the fire. That's revival. Fire, fire. Gold, what's gold? I count you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What's my gold? My gold is that which I do for the glory of God. Everything else is my God. Now when revival comes, fire's coming. And when the fire's coming, there's going to be some big bonfire. And all the garbage, everything that man ever did in his why, which was not for the glory of God, is going to be burned up. I'm here tonight. Why? Not what, but why? Oh, well, Glenn asked me. Well, whether Glenn asked me or not, am I in the will of God? Oh, well, I'm here. Well, why are you here? Well, I'm a preacher. Oh, so you've got a hole and you have to fill it. Is that it? Oh, well, perhaps you'll give me some money. Is that it? I tell you, brother, sister, while ever we have aborted the revelation of God, never mind babies, 
we are committed to abortion with the revelation of God and we prostituted our calling and our birthright has been trampled in the mud. But revival is coming there. And judgment must begin in the house of God. And people will weep. Joel says, between the porch and the altar, the priests and the ministers will weep. There's going to be brokenness in the house of God. There's going to be weeping in the house of God. There's going to be repentance in the house of God. And people are going to cry out, God, have mercy upon me. And this, to me, is revival. If you have a question, ask a question. Uh, I'd ask you to possibly do it immediately. You know, sometimes people say, well, I want to ask a question. Repeat it for five minutes before they do the question. Ask a question, and then offer if you would repeat the question. Amen. And we'll pick it up on the page. Yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, we'll take a few minutes from that. In the meantime, can I give you somebody? We want to bless a lot. He just mentioned money, but he didn't need to sell. And I know that. I've, I've never known about anything about money, but at the same time, he has to come over here, and he has to stay in the house, and I think this is like a blessing. He wanted to just pass off his plate, let's leave here between you, and we'll write a check out of Jeff writing it to the church, we'll give one check for all of it, you don't have to do that, but uh, I'll make it easy on him, he can't pay, American checks and things like that, so uh, that'd be like this pass. Who has a question? Our brother says, what can I do to bring revival? Well, stop trying to revive my wife. Stop trying to revive my husband. And concentrate on myself. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And it will begin with me. I am not here tonight to put you right. I can't. If I wanted to. I'm responsible for God, before God, to put this man right. And I realize a principle that only where I die can I minister life. And you know the difference. They said he taught them as one that had a thought and not as a scribe. What was the matter with the scribe? Well, there were whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones whitewashed on the outside, a pretense. Now, God will deal with me, not with you. That's not my business. And so many people want to put other people right. Husbands want to put their wives right. Wives want to put their husbands right. Parents want to put the children right. Blah, 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 blah. Judgment begins with God dealing with me. Out from that, there comes consequences. But that's not my business. My first business is to get right with God myself. I don't know what to say any more than that, brother. Our sister asks the question, what do we mean by touching the glory of God? Well, in the Old Testament, there's a word used for glory. And in the New Testament, there's a word used for glory. They're not the same. In the New Testament, it's doxia. You talk about the glory of the setting sun, uh, the glory of or a, a, a magnificent animal, a horse, or so on. That's the conscious manifest 
presence of God, which he'll give you. Jesus said, Father, the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them. But when you come to Isaiah, where God says, my glory will I not give to another, you're now dealing with another word entirely. I don't know whether I can think of it at the moment. Someone else, you know. Old Testament. My glory, what is it? It's, it's, no, it's, oh, wait a minute. Um, it's coming. Uh, what happened to the man? Oh, it's kabod. Kabod. Now, ikabod means the glory is departed. Ikabod, the glory is departed. Kabod, K-A-B-O-D, which means weight or honor or if you, perhaps in our ordinary language today, credit. Now, I don't know about your country, but in my country, they also have, builders have a thing called a hut. And you can put perhaps 10 or 12 bricks in that hut. And your brick player, your builder, goes up the ladder. Oh, up the ladder. <laughs> The builder goes up the ladder, but he needs one hand to hold on. He cannot fill his arms with bricks and go up the ladder because he'd do an Arthur Burt like me, fall backwards. God's mercy, I didn't break my neck. But uh, you can't do that. You can't carry a dozen bricks up a ladder. Now then, what do you do? He has a hut, which is a pole, and a container that will take a dozen bricks. So he puts the hod on his shoulder and he holds on the ladder and he goes up with the bricks. And that way he is able to carry more than he can bear. That's a Hebrew word, hod. And again, it's related to credit, the glory. Now, when God blesses you, something happens. The glory or the credit either goes to God or comes to your character. If it comes to your character, you're in trouble. You've touched the glory. If it goes back to God, of him through him to him, of him through him to him, of him through him to him, and even that which is through you is through him through you. The glory, the credit must go back to God. If it doesn't, you're in trouble. Look in your Bible. Uzzah touched the ark. Dead. King Isaiah was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. He finished up a leper in a little hut. The end of his day. Nebuchadnezzar says, It's not this mighty Babylon that I have built. God withdrew his sanity. For seven years, he was like a beast in the field. Ate grass, nails like bird's claws, hair wet with the dew of heaven. And after seven years, he testified, my reason returned to me, and I blessed the God of heaven, the proud, whom he is able to obey. He did not learn that in a Bible class. He didn't read it in a book. He learned it the hard way. Herod, on a set day, arrayed in royal apparel, made a speech. People said it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him. He was smitten in his bowels and he died because he gave not God the glory. Let me say to you, brother, sister, there's one thing I've learned. I've had my fingers burned again and again by putting them in the fire by touching the glory of God. I've done it. 
And what happens when you take the credit to yourself? You incur the jealousy of God, and you're in trouble. You know, Arthur, I'm on the, on the uh, tape here, so you don't need to repeat this one. But we talked about how that our own sense of inferiority, our own sense of insecurity, our lack of self-sufficiency, or whatever, uh, our attitudes toward ourselves limit what we can do for God. And uh, it was a powerful thing that he was talking about. And Arthur, could you just pick that up? You know what I'm referring to. And just pick that up and just share what you did to us and then uh, beyond that, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Jesus said to his people, his disciples, I have many things yet to say to you, but you're not able to bear them. He was not deceiving them, but he was holding back because they could not bear beyond a point of truth. This introduces a whole new area of daring. Daring. Now, if you are not able to bear, God will limit what he will do through you because he will not give his glory to another. Now, he has means of operating like he did with Paul imposing upon him a thorn in the flesh, whereby he was able to carry more than he could bear, because what he couldn't bear, the thorn, came into his life. What the thorn was, I don't know. Could have been stomach ulcer, or his mother-in-law, or a squint eye, I don't know. But he had something that kept bringing him down. And three times he said, oh God, take it away. And God didn't. Twice in the one verse, the Spirit of God has made Paul put down, lest I should be insulted above men. So there was a feeling with Paul in the day of measure. Whether there is now for you is another matter. But in the day of measure there was a feeling. Now, in the same way that the copper ball or the platinum ball in your toilet tank, when you flush the tank, it's all automatic. And it fills up, it lifts the ball, it pushes the arm, it shuts the valve. There is something in God like that, in a compulsion which can come to your body, physically, to your morals, to your finances, to your circumstances. Not that God pushes me in the mud, but God by his mighty power keeps me upright out of the mud. But the moment I touch the glory, he withdraws the grace down I go. Uh, Norman, what's the... Uh, um, in a car, the equivalent. Um, no. The, the, the thing that's automatic. No. 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 Well, you're getting closer now, Governor. You know, surely. You're... No. Hey, that's it. Thermostat, that's it. Thermostat. There is a divine thermostat in your life. And once you begin to bubble up and you begin to touch the glory of God, there is a divine thermostat which will adjust you. And you say, oh, it's that big old bad devil. Don't bother to blame the devil. The devil is never primary, he's only secondary, and he can only do what God allows him to do and what God permits him to do. Paul said, let 
thou should be exalted above measure. The issue is God's glory. There was given to me, God, primary, a throne in the flesh, whatever, the messenger of Satan, secondary, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now then, surely, in greater light that we have, we're not better than Paul, but we're living in a day of greater light, we see something, that if Paul asked God to move the thing that knocked him down, the obvious answer was not to rise up. Deal with cause, not with consequence. The consequence is dusting cobwebs. The consequence is pulling fruit off the tree. Now, if you want the fruit, cultivate the root. But if you don't want the fruit, put the axe at the root. No good pulling the fruit off. The tree will produce some more fruit. That's consequence. Cut the branches off. It'll grow some more. That's consequence. Take a saw and cut the trunk half down. You've pruned the thing. It'll bush out. It loves it. Only thing you can do if you don't want the fruit, deal with the root, and the root is caught. Now then, God is taking a people to deal with cause. Your pride, your ego, that's the root of all your troubles, and you're located in your judgment. Not judgment of cooking a cake or sewing a button on, not that driving a car, sawing, sawing a piece of wood. No, those unrighteous judgments where I presume to enter secretly into your life and judge why you do what you do. I dare to become God in your life. And I presume to cross the line. And I now know why you do what you do. And I, I don't. God will deal with me because I'm out of order, and I'm judging, and God will judge my judgment. I can't say it as the author said it, obviously, but that uh, our inferiority, our oh, feeling yeah. of that, limits yes. what we're able to do. Yeah. And it's a matter of learning mm -hmm. that it's not us anyway, mm -hmm. that it is. Uh, God that does it in us. So we come to the point of rather dealing with, hey, I feel inferior. We deal with ourselves to let God be the one that does it over and above. Is that is there anything you want to add to that? Pride has two expressions, puff and crush, up and down. When I'm up, I'm puffed. When I'm down, I'm crushed. When I'm up, I'm superior. When I'm down, I'm inferior. But it's the same thing, and God will deal with you when you're down, and thereby you'll be ready for your up. If you are hurt because you're left out, God will leave you out until you're not hurt about being left out, because God only left you out to put you in. And he's dealing with that thing in me that wants to feed. You didn't give me a kid. You didn't, you, you passed me by. You, well, he'll deal with that when he puts me out. And when I'm not offended and I'm not put out, when he's put me out, then I'm ready for God to put me in for his glory. Uh, do you want to? It, we've been here an hour and a half. Uh, well, let's, let's see. Is there any other one question that you think is important? Buddy? Our brother asked the question, can I first shock you? 
deliberately. But then don't throw me out till I'm finished. I do less praying now in my life than I've ever done. Brother, maybe you consider I'm totally backslidden. When you birth Ishmael, you've got to do a lot of praying. If God birthed Isaac, whether you pray or you don't, birth settles death. I would rather have a child who listened to me when we went for a walk than a child who kept saying, Ooh, buy me a balloon. I want an ice cream. Can I have a bike for my birthday? So much of our prayer life is empty, self-centered, are not birthed of the Spirit of God. We don't know what we should pray for as we ought. As he reigns in the time of the latter day. Jesus communed. I worship. I give thanks. I listen. But there's a whole lot of praying that I don't do now, but I want to do. Now, whatever you think of me, I love you just the same, but I'm stating something. On a principle, the greater includes the lesser. Some things you don't have to pray about. If you've had the witness of God, you know. You can rejoice, you can give thanks, but you don't have to keep saying, oh, give me, give me, give me, give me. The people of God are notorious as a lot of creamy guineas. God, the big Santa Claus upstairs, throwing toffees down to you and me. If you learn to be content with whatsoever state you're in, there'll be a lot of things you're not free to pray about. Paul says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. A lot of our prayer life is garbage. I am not talking about communion with the Lord or worshipping. I'm talking about the immaturity that many people have, that if they get revelation, they know that the greater includes the lesser. I turn to that book and I read there, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And one of the verses is, give us this day our daily bread. Lick your thumb, turn the page on it. And he says, take no thought what you shall eat. Absolutely contradicts what he said. Take no thought what you shall eat. He just told me to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Take no thought what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or whether all you shall be clothed. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all your goals become in 